they took a part of the software from the Ariane 4 and took it in the same way and used it in a, used it in the same way in Ariane 5, but the environment was different. So in Ariane 5, the whole uh, computing machinery was uh, much faster, so more measurement data was produced, and so an overflow occurred. Well, technically no overflow occurred, but a potential overflow was detected, and that raised an exception, and then the system went into some undefined state. So what can you learn from this example? So if you have a subcomponent, and you think that the subcomponent is verified, then you have to be, uh, you have to understand that you usually verify with respect to certain assumptions. And if you take a verified component and you re-employ it under a different assumption, in a different environment, in a setting where now more measurements are uh, produced, <coughs> then the verification proof doesn't need to hold. And the other message here is, well, you can detect errors at runtime, and you can throw exceptions, but if you don't deal with them, it still might not help you to fix the problem. Then there is the loss of the Mars climate orbiter from 99. So it worked for some time, but then the communication was lost. And what was the problem here? <coughs> the probe was at an altitude of 57 kilometers instead of a calculated 150 and 170. And um, then some problem destroyed the whole system. And the problem was one of the typical ones that the people were different, they're used to different units. So it's better to, to work only on continental Europe all the time with people in continental Europe. Then. Or you could work with a programming language having strong type systems. Yeah, so in a sense, there are different types available. <coughs> Americans and, and the problem also uh, making confusion between Baltic miles and uh, road miles, I think. Uh, Maybe. And shuttle. That's one of the typical problems that uh, you talk about numbers, but you have an implicit unit in mind, and different people have different units in mind. And uh, when you think about program languages, a, a type system, not only saying something like integer values or something like that, but having a, a type like kilometers per hour or let's say pounds or something like that, that would help to spot these kind of bugs. So that's one way of dealing uh, with the problem of getting better software. Then there is a Mars Polar Lander. And uh, also at some point, the communication got lost, and they assumed that this one crashed, and that the, uh, the sensors actually delivered wrong values. So they assumed that they're close over the, the surface and stop the the engine so that it goes down. So they did it too high, and they crashed. But uh, that's what they assume. They have no proof about it always hard to check what happened on the Mars. So, yeah, I mean, what's the message here? I mean, okay, it's not sure that the input values that you get are correct. Maybe you should do some extra uh, computation or some take some extra measures to make sure that you are indeed on the right level. Um, the power shut down of the USS Yorktown is also a nice example. So they, on these battleships, they have kitchen applications where they enter the amount of stuff that they bring into the kitchen. Because they, they go on this mission for like three months or so, so they need a lot of food. And if they have some wood to keep in, they enter <coughs> the amount of all the stuff. And apparently, 
for some of the stuff, they didn't bring anything. So one of the uh, sailors typed in a zero. And then the problem was also doing some statistics and apparently did the division by zero. Um, and um, that led to a crash of one of the subsystems and the error uh, trend it got propagated through the whole battleship. And so the whole battleship wasn't uh, possible to operate for several hours. So what can you learn from this example? Bring enough food from every kind of stuff. <laughs> um, you should come up with a, the right uh, software architecture. And so, but the main problem here is, okay, you might have a division by zero error in the kit. Okay, it's not nice, but one can do with it. But such an error must never be able to propagate through the whole uh, software and also the, the engine control of the system. So we see from these examples that there are many different uh, things uh, that are applicable to develop good uh, software software of high quality. Uh, some of them are verification. Another example I would like to, to mention is the Pantheon bug. So the, the older ones of you may remember, I guess. So the Pantheon, uh, one of the first Pantheons did some, for some com uh, <coughs> combinations of numbers, they did their own computation. So if you take this number and you subtract this number divided by that, multiplied by that. Yes, so you see, dividing by this, multiplied by that, should be one. So we get the same number, so the result should be zero. But the pension produced the result to 156. Why was that? Um, the, the, algorithm, and the algorithms they implement on these um, Processors are highly optimized. Um, they use some kind of, let's say, an approximation algorithm, which work in many cases, but for some combinations, um, they don't work correctly. And for these combinations, they have typically some tables on the chip and they check it. If it is one of these exceptions, then they use a different algorithm. So they use a fast algorithm, which works in most cases, and for some exceptions, they use uh, some other one, and they basically forgot uh, one of these exceptions. And um, the probability that you have to deal with this, uh, or that you're, that you're hit by this problem in practice, I would say it's extremely small because it's just for a few combinations of numbers. So if you do a lot of, uh, if you work a lot with Fractions like Excel, and the probability that you hit errors because wrong software implementation of Excel is much higher than by this stuff. But at that time, uh, that's one of these sad uh, yeah, changes over the years. By that time, it was everybody had the idea: my hardware is correct and software is fine. Yeah, so if you buy piece of software and you run it and it crashes, okay, then you restart. That was completely accepted. But hardware has to be correct. So it cost Intel a hell of money they, uh, because many customers, they brought the computer back to the shops and said, okay, my computer is wrong. It has a problem. It has a bug. So I want to get a new version of the pencil processor. So it's kind of I mean, nowadays, when you buy computers, software and hardware together, it's so buggy and everybody accepts that, but at that time it was a big deal. And also the competition between Intel and AMD was very strong at that time. So it was a good argument for AMD to sell their processes by just saying that at least they know how to compute. So that's one of the Same in the automotive industry. Uh, safety of people is one issue, it's important, it's, but the main problem is um, that you also have good public relations. 
So the, the problem with the cars is not about the danger that somebody got hurt. The problem is that somebody got hurt and that it is spread all over the news. So there is another German car uh, manufacturing which has a uh, not so good public relations at the moment. Technically, I'm not sure whether it's a big deal or not, but anyway. Okay, so a bunch of old examples. <coughs> there are still many examples going on all the time. When I was at the airport in, I think it was Bogota, there was one of these screens again where you see some windows running, and there was a message that the application couldn't be loaded because of this and that. And you see this all the time. Okay, so we see it's uh, the spectacular bugs, and uh, but economically more interesting is the mass of very small bugs and the amount that people have to spend on finding these bugs as well. And that's why we want to work on different verification techniques and why we want to study front verification uh, during the next three days. So we start with the definition of testing. What is testing? Testing is the examination of a subset of the behaviors of the program of the system. So you run the system for several uh, input data. That's kind of the idea. And that's also why testing can, be, can detect the presence of errors, but they cannot prove the absence. Yeah, so we call it a partial verification technique. Point some other definitions from the book of Ethics, for example. So you run the program on what we call a test suite. So it's a set of test cases. And the test suite is a subset of the possible inputs. An element is called the test case. And running the test case is what we call a test run. Why can't we prove a system, a system correct? By testing, well, typically most programs have infin infinitely many possible inputs. If you think about fun function com uh, computing the square root of something, you have infinitely many numbers. You cannot test it on all of them. Even if there are only finitely many inputs, the program can be buggy and have infinitely many executions, or can have non-deterministic behavior, and so on. So. We basically do not try to give a, a kind of a correctness proof, but we want to <coughs> be quite sure that the system is working okay. There is a famous quote by Dijkstra that I already mentioned, testing should control the presence of errors, but never their absence. Myers have also mentioned that testing is a destructive process, even a sadistic process. Well, why so? What does it mean? Why, well, <clears throat> that depends or that refers to... The, so in many companies you have the developers and you have a testing department. And it has advantages, also disadvantages, that they sometimes know each other very well because there are a lot of typical mistakes done by the programmers. And uh, you have to be, it's a, it's a little bit like reviewing the paper, right? So you know that this guy has submitted a paper to the conference, you look and you know already by the author, hey, I know that you will be a little bit shaky with the basic definitions and there's a good reason to reject the paper. And so if you're too, too nice person, you will accept it. So that's the same with the testing and all. So you, you really should try to understand what are the typical problems and what are the difficult areas of the code, and then it's much easier for you to find those. But this is hold, mainly holds for manually derived test cases. <coughs> so you should be motivated by finding bugs of other people. And, uh, it's also why it's hard for companies to find people working in the testing area. 
because for most people it's much more interesting to be constructive and to write programs rather than to find the errors done by others. Okay. Testing reveals errors in programs if the program does not what it is supposed to do. Um, programs that do not what they're supposed to do can still contain errors if they do more than what they're supposed to do. So in some sense, it's always important that you check for the behavior that it, the program is supposed to have, but also for the behavior that the program is not supposed to have. So there's the good behavior and the bad behavior. If you're working in the field of model-based testing, just for, for those who know that, then uh, there the idea is you build a model and all the runs of your model are executed on the real system and you compare both systems in that way, which is not a good approach. I mean, it's one approach that you check these runs, but the model also, if the model is somehow complete, you should also check which runs are not possible in the model and you should also test that these runs are not possible in the implementation of your system. Okay, and what will become uh, clearer on the next pages is that testing is a verification technique and in verification we compare the behavior of the system with the specification. If the specification is buggy, then the system can be buggy too. So what do we mean by verification here? What we mean by verification is are we building the product right? in contrast to validation, are we building the right product? So validation means, do we build a system that the customer wants to have? So the customer has some rough idea about the program that he wants to have. And from these rough ideas, we derive a specification, ideally a formal specification. And then, uh, we can do the programming and in verification we compare the program with the specification. So what you heard about uh, this morning by um, correct by construction, that's the idea that you start from the specification and you refine it to the program. Here uh, we assume in verification we assume a different setup. We basically do the work twice, we do the work by coming up with a specification and coming up with a program and then we compare. And we can compare in different ways. So, validation and verification. And in that sense, um, well, let's come up with the definition of what we're using. Verification is comparing the code with its specification. That's what we mean by a verification form. The definition is uh, basically an excerpt from IEEE definition 10 of the Elizabeth version 2004. You can read it when you have time. Um, the essential thing is that testing and runtime verification, I haven't told you what runtime verification is, but anyway, these are both verification techniques. So there is uh, there are different kind of schools. So some say every partial verification technique is more like validation. But here we use the IEEE definition. Okay. And we have let's we distinguish here between complete and partial verification. Model checking, for example, would be a complete verification. So what is runtime verification? Runtime verification is a discipline of computer science that deals with the study, development, and application of those verification techniques that allow for checking whether a run of the system under scrutiny satisfies or violates a given <coughs> property. So what do we have here? So we talk about runtime verification. It's something from computer science. And We have long debates of what it is, but uh, in some sense, what compromises? Okay, we do a lot of work within the field of runtime verification. So what do we do? We study and we develop and we apply techniques to verify systems. So we work with verification uh, techniques, 
And what is the main characteristic? Well, we look at the run of the system. So we execute the system symbolically or in real, typically in real. <coughs> and we have a correctness property specified. And we check whether this correctness property is satisfied or why not. That's the idea of the work. What is a run of the system? A run of the system is a possible <coughs> infinite sequence of the system states or system event sequence, something like that. So formally it's an infinite word. Could be the current variable assignments in the computer forming the states, or it can be a sequence of events the system is embedding um, something. And formally, we assign a wording to an execution or a prefix of a, a run of the system because typically we observe the system and we said a run is a possibly infinite sequence. So we have something like a web server in mind that the web server is ideally running forever. And the interaction with the web server, that's what we are going to check. And it's a potentially infinite <coughs> run. Um, but of course, we don't have an infinite amount of time of serving the complete one. So what we are checking is a <coughs> finite prefix. Meaning, we observe the system for a finite amount of time, so we have a finite word. And that is a prefix of the potentially infinite one. And that is what we call an execution. So an execution of the system is a finite prefix of a run, so formally a finite trace. And random verification is thus applied on executions. When we think about a complete run given from a model, then we are more in the area of model chain. And to check the run, we use monitors. And the monitor is a device that checks whether the execution satisfies the correctness property or not. So practically, or well, formally we say a monitor is a device that reads a finite trace, a finite word, and yields a certain verdict. So I use word and trace here uh, as synonyms. So how can you think about it? So we have a system, let's say, here we have four components, they are interconnected. <coughs> and to such a system, we add a monitor. And the monitor observes, for example, what is going on between C1 and C3. The input is sent to the monitor, and the monitor says, OK, there is a bug, or everything is fine, something like that. So that's kind of the uh, very simple <coughs> picture that we have in mind. It could also be that the monitor actually gets tuples of input something like, say, what is entered into the component C, or what is, and what is the output, and formally then we we'll get parts of that, but practically it gets a sequence of uh, letters and derives a wording from that. This looks like components that are communicating over the network, but it could also be something like the, the call graph of uh, procedures, methods. So like every call from C1 to C3 emits some log event that the monitor checks. Something like that. So. Okay, so <coughs> I hope you have a rough idea now what testing and random verification means and uh, we concentrate more on random verification in the following. And first, what we like to do is we want to compare it to other verification techniques. So we said already that we have on one end testing. So in testing, we have a sequence of input and output letters. First input, second, uh, first output. And <coughs> we want to know whether the system has satisfied this input-output sequence. So typically, we select such a sequence manually. Say, OK, if you send this, then if you send a hello to the mail server, 
it should send them acknowledge and you send the recipient's address and it says okay, something like that. Yeah. And the main research topic is how can we find good test cases? How can we find good input output sequences? That's kind of the idea. And the current execution must be correct, meaning we send the input to the system and check whether the output is as expected. That's one typical way of understanding testing. Another typical way is uh, what we call the Oracle testing. In a sense, it's uh, similar, but rather than a test case consisting of pairs of input and expected output, in Oracle testing, the test case is just a sequence of input actions that is sent to the system. You send it to the system, but then at the same time, you also have an Oracle attached to the system. And the Oracle has the idea, or has the, the role, that it checks whether for the given input, the system behaves correctly. That is, what we call this like, Test oracle. And this is very similar. Okay. Again, we uh, okay. We, we might <coughs> derive input sequences automatically, but the test oracle is typically written manually. So you have some Java code and you write some kind of Java oracle or some oracle in Java, and then you generate test cases and you see whether the system behaves. And uh, again, the current execution must be correct. Here, the output sequence must be as expected. And here, the monitor and the Oracle may not uh, report a problem. And when you look at the testing literature, uh, many papers deal with the question, how can we derive good, good test cases in the sense, how can we cover a lot of the code? And then you have 20 million different definitions of coverage. And, uh, 21 million different, different algorithms computing test cases. On the other hand, we have run verification. And that actually is, looks pretty much the same as testing with oracles. So we send input sequences to the system and we attach a monitor to the system. And the current execution, meaning the sequence uh, of inputs that we send to the system, should not lead to a violation by the monitor. So what is technically the main difference? The main difference is that we synthesize monitors from correctness properties and not verification. We don't want to program the oracle by hand, but we want to give high level correctness criteria and synthesize monitors automatically. That's the main research question and that's the main topic that we're going to talk about during the course. Okay, then there is model checking. What is the idea of model checking? So in model checking, we have a system, like we have it, uh, run verification as well, but we have it explicitly given. And we also have a correctness property like we have in run verification. And we want to know whether all executions of our system satisfy our correctness property, effectively meaning whether the set of executions of our system S is a subset of the execution settings fine fine. So here we have a classical language problem, and it's also the reason why you can use automata techniques to solve this question. And the main difference to random verification is that we are interested in all possible runs of our system. While in random verification we consider just one individual run. And that's also what makes uh, Quantum verification uh, quite simple in some sense because we mainly deal with this monitor stuff here. Here we have to take a large system into account. So, in some sense, yeah, so we're not we're no longer interested in the current execution but in all parts of the system. So, in some sense, if you can do model checking, that's much better than uh, doing random verification because you're verify the correctness for all of your runs. While in one verification, you look at just at the individual one. Then again, very often, 
this doesn't scale in practical examples. So you can concentrate on certain aspects of your system and do model tracking for this, but typically not on the huge uh, application, while this scales much better in practice. So the, the size of the monitors similar like the automata based approaches in model tracking and somewhat exponential, double exponential in the size of your formula, which is not a big deal because we are not able to write long formulas. Because we have to come up with the formulas. And typically the properties we want to check are short. The system is the problem here. There's also something like theory proving. And in theory proving, we also try to verify that the system satisfies uh, a given property file. But you do it using um, proof calculus. So basically, you take a bunch of general actions together with uh, your program, and you derive that your property satisfies that. That's the rough idea. So, very often the proof is done manually, so you have a theory prover, which is an interactive theory prover that um, makes sure that every proof step that you do is according to the rules, but you have to be the genius to find out the proof. And then there are the automatic theory provers that simplify a lot of lead work, but in, generally, in, in general, you still have to do a lot of work in a manual way, at least that's my, my understanding of the theory proof. But then again, the expressivity is, is higher in the sense that in model checking, you mostly can apply it only for finite state systems, while well, you can do rich. So we have a bunch of different techniques Improve, clearly improving model checking, random verification, testing. And um, sequence generation is the main stuff. Monitor synthesis is what we are interested in here. We want to, here we want to show the correctness of the whole program here as well. We deal with all runs. Here we only with the current execution. So uh, I hope that you get some ideas. About the different verification techniques. So, what we already have seen definitions for testing, verification, and validation. And we will concentrate mostly on temporal logic and multi volume semantics of these logics in this course. And um, why is that? We use temporal logic for specifying correctness properties. And then we, and, and correctness in the run to verification is. Um, many volume because in, in model tracking either the property is satisfied or not. In random verification you observe the system for a short time. And then you naturally comes up that you want to say, okay, the property is satisfied, the property is not satisfied, or I just don't know yet. Maybe if I observe the system for a longer time then I know that it definitely has violated the property. So that's why that I will say is also the more interesting stuff is we extend the typical stuff that you know for temporal logics to, uh, towards a multi volume semantics. We study finite automata for building monitors, for doing monitor synthesis. Look at the corresponding constructions. Um, first, a simple approach using formula rewriting and then more sophisticated automata constructions. In time um, verification, if the property is not satisfied with the monitor, can we get can we get a counterexample? Like the run itself is a counterexample. Okay. <coughs> and I may say a few words on run verification frameworks as well. So we have a break now, yes. and then after the break, we can talk. Perfect. That's what you have to write. That's the UK. Perfect. Uh, That's the UK. <laughs> 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 <laughs>